Hello, and good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are joining us from today. Welcome to Engineering for Change, or E4C for short. Today, we're very pleased to bring you the latest in E4C's 2017 webinar series on the topic of the next generation of standards. My name is Jana Aranda, and I'm the president at Engineering for Change. I'll be moderating today's webinar, and I'm very excited to be doing so. The webinar you're participating in today is part of E4C's professional development offerings. Information on upcoming webinars in the series, as well as archived videos of past presentations, including the one today, will be found on the E4C webinars webpage, as well as on our YouTube channel. Both of the URLs for those resources are listed here. If you have any questions, comments, and recommendations for future topics and speakers, we encourage you to contact the E4C webinars team at webinars at engineeringforchange.org. If you're following us on Twitter today, I invite you to join the conversation with our dedicated hashtag, hashtag E4C webinars. Before we move on to our presenters, I'd like to tell you a bit about Engineering for Change. E4C is a knowledge organization and global community of over 1 million engineers, designers, development practitioners, and social scientists who are leveraging technology to solve quality of life challenges faced by underserved communities worldwide. Some of those challenges include access to clean water and sanitation, sustainable energy solutions, improved agriculture, and more. We invite you to become a member E4C membership is free and provides access to current news, data on hundreds of essential technologies in our solutions library, professional development resources, and information on opportunities such as jobs, conferences, fellowships, and others. Mm -hmm. E4C members enjoy a unique user experience based on their site behavior and engagement. Essentially, the more you interact with the E4C site, the better we will be able to serve you resources aligned to your interests. For more information, please visit our website and learn more and sign up. Our next webinar will be on October 25th on the topic of innovation in microgrids. And we'll be joined by three fantastic speakers, Henry Louis, who is the co-founder of Kilowatts for Humanity, Frank Berg, VP of Grid Engineering at Segora, and Omar Ghani, the CEO of the startup Kilowatt Labs. That will be happening at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, and we will be learning about new technology and approaches for scaling microgrids in low resource settings. Please see the E4C Professional Development page soon for additional information and registration details. If you're already an E4C member, we'll be sending you an invitation to that webinar directly. Another reason to sign up. So, a few housekeeping items before we get started. Let's practice the using the WebEx platform by telling us where in the world you're joining us from. In the chat window, which is located at the bottom right hand of your screen, please type your location. If the chat is not open on your screen, try clicking the chat icon on the top right hand corner of the WebEx platform. All right, so I'll get us started here. And Oh, there we go, we already have some folks answering. All right, so I'm here from New York. We have folks from Michigan, Ohio, Indiana, Alaska. Well, that's pretty far. Uh, way, farther still, Wales. Well, thank you so much for joining us, and I encourage everybody to share your location. Welcome to everyone from all over these states and beyond. We see Canada, we see Tampa. There we go. All right. Use the chat window to share remarks during the webinar, speak with your fellow attendees, and uh, share any insights you may have. If you have any technical questions, just feel free to send a private chat to the Engineering for Change admin. During the webinar, we encourage you to use the Q&A window, which is located right below the chat, to type in your questions for the presenters. That allows us to keep track of them. Again, if you don't see it, click the Q&A icon on the top right-hand corner of the WebEx screen. If you are listening to the audio broadcast and you encounter any trouble, try hitting stop and then start. You may also want to try opening WebEx up in a different browser. 
E4C webinars qualify engineers for one professional development hour. To request your PDH, please follow the instructions on the top of the E4C professional development page after the presentation. The URL is listed here as well. Again, thank you everyone for joining us uh, from, I, I've had some private responses to where you are, and I see that uh, we have folks from the Netherlands, from Denver, uh, from Ottawa in Canada, and many other places. Um, to send a message uh, to all attendees, just click on the send to down button and you can share that way with everyone. But I do appreciate you telling me privately where you're from. All right, so I'd like to tell you a little bit about today's webinar and our presenters. Essential technology, which is defined as products and services designed to address the world's most critical challenges, including access to potable water, information, sanitation, and more, these technologies are continuing to evolve. Consequently, so is the need for new standards to ensure performance and safety to end users. Investing in appropriate standards for new and emerging technology is an important aspect of achieving the sustainable development goals that have been agreed to by the UN. Today, we are joined by Moira Patterson, who is the Global Affairs Director of IEEE, and Sun Kim, who is the Program Officer at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, to learn more about standards development in two critical sectors, sanitation and ICT. As I mentioned, our first presenter is going to be Moira Patterson. She oversees the implementation of the IEEE Standard Association's global strategy in different regions and various related strategic initiatives, including on standardization, capacity building, and policy. She has been driving IEEE SA's engagements in Africa and Europe for over five years and is also responsible for managing the IEEE SA's adoption and cooperation agreements with standards development organizations worldwide. By promoting science potential to support sustainable development, Moira contributes to IEEE's mission of advancing technology for the benefit of humanity. And for everybody to know, IEEE is one of the co-founding organizations of E4C, so very pleased to have Moira here. She will be followed by Sun Kim. Sun Kim graduated from the University of Washington in 1984 with a BS in mechanical engineering, so he'll be very comfortable in the company of fellow engineers on the line today. He's worked in the oil fields of the Middle East as a geophysical test engineer for Schlumberger Wireline Services and for Boeing Commercial Airplanes for 20 years on pressurized door structures, mechanisms, and systems design, analysis, test, and certification. In 2014, Sun started working at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation as a program officer on the water sanitation and hygiene team. He's part of the transformative technology sub-team, developing and managing philanthropic investments in the area of international standards, reinvented toilets, and more. We're very excited to have uh, these wonderful speakers join us today. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and pass control over to our first speaker, Moira, and have her share her insights with you. Moira? Hi, thank you, Jana, for that uh, introduction, and thank you for having me. Hello, everyone, and uh, it's my pleasure to speak to the Engineering for Change community about standardization and related activities. As you saw from my uh, bio, I work for IEEE and strategic outreach and capacity building globally uh, with a focus on, on work in Africa. Um, also, I am uh, engaged in some of our technology policy activities and have attended, for example, the World Summit on Information Society and similar uh, venues uh, that you may be familiar with if you're engaged in the ICT community. And I'm uh, trying to advance. There we go. As you know, uh, ICTs are a key enabler in achieving the Sustainable Development Goals across the board, uh, from the very visible application of ICT, such as people using the internet and leveraging it to access new markets uh, and know uh, research prices of goods and be empowered with that information, but also to underlying applications, such as how we leverage data behind the scenes to make better and more impactful decisions. Um, before highlighting some specific standardization projects where uh, we will also encourage you to get engaged if you have an interest, 
I will briefly speak about standardization more generally. Um, while my focus is on ICT-related projects, I will also highlight a few projects in the power sector because there is no ICT without power, um, and so they have a fundamental connection to this. And uh, finally, I want to also introduce some very exciting work that IEEE is doing uh, to advance really a, a focus on the human needs in technology development. So as we get started, um, as many in the audience are engineers, you will likely know IEEE for, for IEEE's traditional activities such as membership services, um, also membership activities for students, um, engineering, conferences, publications on te key technology topics, etc. Building on these foundations of IEEE's technical expertise and global reach, IEEE also has developed a lot of programs to help both our members and also the organization at an institutional level to achieve and contribute to our mission of advancing technology for humanity and having reaching social impact. And I will touch on some of these programs today. Uh, some of the programs, though, are uh, in public policy, technology policy, and uh, humanitarian activities, to name a few. I will first talk about standards and their impact. Our mission is to provide high-quality, market-relevant standardization environment respected worldwide. Now, I want to elaborate on, on market relevance a bit, as it is a key phrase, and I want to highlight that markets uh, are very different depending on the technology and depending on the need. So IEEE covers uh, markets from really high-tech areas such as uh, finding the, the next frontier of faster and better Wi-Fi, uh, but also we look at standards to bring energy to remote rural areas worldwide. So uh, when we talk about market relevance, it really depends on what market you're looking at, uh, what, what kind of um, impact we are looking at. IEEE is a platform for collaboration and consensus building. And one of the important ingredients is bringing the right stakeholders to the table. Uh, this includes innovators, technologists, engineers, but also government representatives, societal stakeholders and advocates, and sometimes even social scientists, increasingly as we look at ethical questions. One of the key points in this is also that you really are open to enabling all materially interested stakeholders to participate, and that is one of the key principles of IEEE. Some key attributes of standardization is having clear, documented, and transparent processes. The WTO has outlined some key principles for standardization, and these principles are, are globally accepted. Um, an open stand uh, is a group of internet-related standards organizations who have also articulated similar uh, principles. Uh, and IEEE subscribes to both of those, and transparency, openness, and consensus are some of the key attributes that, uh, that, that we follow. I do want to highlight that in order to achieve consensus, it is important to have a balance of stakeholders involved. I've already talked about that a little bit, that the stakeholders come from all uh, backgrounds and expertise, they also uh, represent um, country or come from countries worldwide. And that is really key to, to have globally relevant standards that you have all the different stakeholders at the table and that you have a, a balance between them. So you can't have one uh, stakeholder group, uh, say one type of uh, producers of a device or users of a device be in a majority. Uh, you need a balance of the different types of stakeholders. A final note, um, the WTO explicitly encourages the, the development dimension in standardization, meaning that SDOs should consider the constraints of, of stakeholders in, in developing countries. 
And so IEEE has electronic tools to facilitate participation and reduce travel costs um, to try to address that. Okay, and so in a nutshell, why should we use global standards? What impact do they have? Standards are published documents that establish the specifications and procedures to ensure the reliability and safety of materials, products, methods, and services that we use every day. They serve as fundamental building blocks for product development, and they establish consistent protocols that can be universally used. They also are key in establishing interoperability uh, and help speed up time to market. As a customer, uh, they have the advantage of making it easier to understand and to compare products uh, and also enable us to have more choice in the marketplace. When products are standardized, we can uh, buy from different manufacturers and different vendors. Standards that are globally adopted also help uh, with international trade and with technology transfer, and I think that's a key attribute as well. Finally, they do reduce risk because we, we can rely on the, the proven processes that they were developed through, including the transparency of, of, of knowing um, who the participants were and, and that there was a balanced set of experts involved. And they also, by being standardized and universally usable, uh, reduce the risk of vendor lock-in, of only having access to products from one vendor. And then I will also briefly introduce conformity assessment which is the process and processes that we use to demonstrate that a product or service meets uh, the specified requirements that are outlined in a, in a standard or in a test plan. Such conformity assessment uh, provides manufacturer a method to demonstrate compliance to the requirements. It empowers the end user to make better purchasing decisions knowing that a product has been certified um, and so it also helps the supplier get their products to market more quickly. And in the end, it helps a technology marketplace to grow more quickly. And it reduces the, the barriers to the adoption of a technology. There are different types of conformity assessment. Uh, the, the three types are first party self-declaration, whereby uh, the supplier does their own testing and declares compliance. Uh, second party, where the purchaser does the testing. And third party, where a third party independent body conducts the testing. Um, the choice of which type of testing to follow uh, will of course be made by the supplier and can take into consideration various factors including time to market, cost of the, the testing tools, and also what level of uh, and buyer confidence that they want to inspire. So speaking of, of global standards, uh, I also want to give a, an example of, a, of the importance of local implementation. And here we have an example of the National Electric Safety Code, which is a standard that uh, outlines the, the procedures uh, and safety precautions that workers who maintain the power grid take. This document um, was used as the foundation for Pakistan's safety code, making, enabling them to make necessary changes for the environmental and urban conditions in Pakistan to ensure it meets their needs. Uh, they are evaluating the impact of, of the, the Pakistan safety code this year. Um, IEEE has several programs whereby we enable uh, countries to adopt IEEE standards and make necessary changes or use IEEE standards as foundation for their own stand standards um, with the necessary adjustments so that they avoid having to recreate 
standards that have already been developed. So this can uh, significantly cut time and also resource constraints for them. So now to a few projects that are currently undergoing and where we would really welcome uh, interested experts to get engaged. And so first I'll talk briefly about TV white spaces. And of course, this is uh, such a interesting and important topic in, in development that uh, E4C recently had a webinar on this topic alone. Uh, I will just highlight here that IEEE has a standard in this space. Uh, it's called 802.22. And uh, it really um, takes advantage or uh, standardizes this technology, which helps bring connectivity to rural areas where there is low population density and low um, incentive to build out uh, infrastructure. So leveraging this technology using the, the free TV white spaces is very beneficial. Uh, this standard um, is undergoing a revision whereby the existing amendments are being rolled into the, the actual standards document so that it will be one document only. And um, there is a related project actually in an earlier development stage, 802.22.3, which is focusing on specifying operating characteristics of components of spectrum characterization and occupancy sensing systems. This uh, new standard is develop being developed in response to the US and British regulators uh, opening up more spectrum for sharing approaches. And uh, the working group is uh, developing a draft uh, or has developed a draft that they are already uh, refining um, but there are still opportunities to get engaged if that topic is of interest. A related topic is Frugal 5G, and this is a pre-standards project where they are looking at developing low-cost wireless backhaul uh, that we call Frugal 5G for connecting the unconnected. We see that the propagation characteristics are appropriate uh, and will not require expensive infrastructure such as high towers and alternate solutions can be based on technologies such as the IEEE 802.11 or millimeter wave technologies. Um, this project is being led by Professor Karan uh, in India. Another project that is being led uh, by stakeholders from India is P2650, which looks at leveraging existing mobile platforms and devices for pre-screening for hearing impairments. The need for, for this uh, project is clear. Screening for hearing impairment usually takes place in specialized facilities with very expensive equipment. But that is, of course, not accessible to large portions of populations who live in remote areas. Uh, this is even more critical because if you don't identify hearing impairments in newborns before they are six months old, any treatments or interventions have lower chance of success. So by ha leveraging mobile technology that exists and that can reach remote villages, much more easily to do the pre-screening, you can identify um, newborns and others who need this, the more elaborate testing, and then you have a, you can ensure that they get the testing. This project came out of uh, Indian uh, experts who, who identified the need, but now they have over uh, 50 participants in the working group uh, representing all continents and the participants include researchers, government uh, representatives, and also folks with medical backgrounds to really make sure all the, the right stakeholders are at the table. Now quickly to speak about a uh, power project. And this is important to, to bring power to the rural villages as well. Um, we've just talked about bringing connectivity and ICT, but of course without having energy to charge the devices, 
um, there is no ICT. So P2030.10 is a standards project that is under development to enable DC microgrids in rural areas. And uh, again, we see the common theme that in, in remote areas, utilities are disincentivized from investing in creating traditional infrastructure. And so other solutions are being found. And here we are looking at using renewable resources uh, and creating local microgrids to bring power to these small remote villages. A related standard is 1547, which looks at integrating um, renewable resources into the grid. This standard has been in place for a while and is just being revised right now. We have stakeholders uh, being driven by the, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, uh, but we also see interest from many other regions around the world. In fact, this standard is being adopted in Ghana right now, where the, uh, the grid operators saw the need to have a standard to integrate renewables into their grid. We are also partnering with Strathmore University in Kenya on a pilot for a conformity assessment test uh, related to this standard. So we see great potential and interest in this standard and the related conformity assessments uh, in many developing countries as well as in developed countries. Now I want to transition and briefly address some other types of work that we do, uh, which is more focusing on ethical considerations around technology and on a more human-centric approach. We have a, a group called the IEEE Global Initiative on Ethical Considerations in the Design of Artificial Intelligence and Autonomous Systems. And that initiative is developing a lot of different outputs. Um, they have a book that they've developed. You see the image on this slide where they have 13 different work streams where they are really addressing um, all the different themes from public policy and other implementation considerations that need to be addressed to look at this. Another deliverable that they're working on is standards. And I, I'm highlighting one, P7010, that is one standard in a series of, of, of 11 standards at this point. But this one highlights the need to put um, human well-being uh, first. So when we look at technology, we shouldn't just look at, at GDP growth, but we also need to look at human well-being. One example that we often hear is that GDP may go up during a traffic jam because we are uh, burning gas, but human well-being certainly is not going up in such a situation. So uh, this standard is, it's a new project, and we welcome uh, any new participants who are interested in this. And as I said, there are many related activities. Similar, we have uh, a, a pre-standards activity to look at digital inclusion through trust and agency. And really, with the growing need for digital identities uh, and doing things online, we need to look at how can we um, empower people to have, to have control over their digital identity and to choose how and with whom to transact. Um, with this project, we are also proactively reaching out, again, to underserved communities because they need to have a seat at the table to help identify the needs and find solutions. Another similar project is focusing on our identities and on um, digital citizens in the smart city, again, related to 
uh, data and, and huge amounts of data and connectivity, and we need to find integrated solutions. Um, in this project, they are looking at doing a test bed to actually start testing some solutions as well. And then finally, the theme of digital literacy. Uh, in order to be able to take advantage of the ICT, uh, the access to ICT that is provided, people need to understand how to use it. And we have just initiated a pre-standards project, again, looking at um, how to promote digital literacy, bringing together the right stakeholders, including um, advocates for digital literacy, including providers of uh, services, and identify how we can promote digital literacy to all stakeholders around the world, including underserved populations. And then I just wanted to highlight a very exciting project on the same topic. This is uh, a site uh, group that IEEE has. It's a special interest group on humanitarian technology in Tunisia, and they are not developing standards, but they are doing digital literacy training in schools in Tunisia in a hands-on manner. So I wanted to just highlight that IEEE also has more hands-on activities that people can engage in. We have such site groups around the world in many different countries. So I know I've covered a lot of projects and a lot of activities. Uh, I have some further reading here. The first few links will help you identify the status of the projects that I've mentioned. Uh, and then at the very end, the last link is Standards University, and it uh, provides resources on what are standards. It's targeted both at academia and students, but also at other users of standards. So I encourage anyone who wants to learn more to look at that. And then um, finally, I just wanted to say that Engineering for Change uh, is an important platform. IEEE is one of the supporters, and I thank the Engineering for Change team for the, team for the opportunity to highlight all these exciting uh, projects. And I invite everyone to work with IEEE on ICT standards and other activities that take a human-centric view of technology development. Thank, thank you, you for your so time. Much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Moira. Apologies. And um, thank you for uh, taking the time to share these exciting initiatives with us. Um, with that, I'm going to uh, pass over the slide control to our next presenter, uh, Sun. Um, whenever you're ready, we're ready for you. Great. Thank you. Um, can everybody hear me? Loud and clear. Great. Thank you. Let's see. I'm trying to advance the slide here. Um, here we go. There you go. Yeah. Great. So my name is Sun Kim, and uh, I'm a program officer here at the uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And it's a pleasure for me to be here and to um, to be able to share this uh, some of the work that we're doing. Um, I'll start with uh, talking about the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation just real quickly, and then uh, the work we're doing on sanitation for the poor, uh, and then also the role of standards. And as Moira just mentioned, um, you know, the many benefits of standards and, um, and you know, it's one, um, one element of, a, uh, of a, a commercial opportunities. And, and we fundamentally believe that it is through the commercial activities, <clears throat> excuse me, commercial activities that um, we can scale up um, uh, potential solutions uh, to benefit the many. And, uh, and I'd like to thank um, Engineering for Change for the opportunity to uh, share this with you all. So, so at the Gates Foundation, um, we have four main missions uh, to ensure more children and young people survive and thrive and empower the poorest. Um, particularly, we tend to focus on women and girls 
Um, because if we um, uh, don't, are not intentional, oftentimes it's the uh, women, girls, and young children that, that ends up suffering the most from poverty. Uh, we also work on combating infectious diseases uh, that, that particularly tend to affect the poor, especially when you don't have the means or the um, finances to be able to uh, take care of those medical needs. Uh, polio is a great example of one of the uh, big pushes that the foundation has been uh, working to eradicate, and we're getting so close, and, um, and also to inspire other people uh, to, to take action, because uh, it's not just the foundation or other philanthropies and NGOs, but it's really the people um, that are inspired to do the work. And um, we we do this by funding our partners' work on the ground. Um, you know, whether it's research, technology development, uh, commercialization of, of vaccines, medical devices. In our case, uh, sanitation um, products and services. We also work with uh, governments um, at the national and international level, uh, policy makers um, uh, looking at the market. We, we get involved in quite a lot of different areas, and it's um, it's quite exciting to have an organization that's able to fund this kind of work. Um, and just real quickly, the, the, the Gates Foundation is primarily funded uh, by two streams. Uh, one is a trust fund that uh, Bill and Melinda Gates um, uh, put together, and out of that, a certain percentage every year is spent and uh, last year, I think it was about $2.5 billion was available to the foundation for the, the number of initiatives that we have, um, we have going. And then in addition, uh, Warren Buffett has also made a very generous contribution that essentially doubles that amount. So almost $5 billion a year are being spent currently uh, for these uh, different efforts, and one of them being, um, uh, being sanitation. And and why do we do this? Um, we fundamentally believe that all lives have equal value. And, and we think of it from the perspective of regardless of where you're born or who you're born to uh, should not keep you from an opportunity to live a healthy and productive life. Uh, this is what uh, Melinda Gates oftentimes calls the lottery of the womb. And if you're fortunate enough to be uh, born to a rich family or in a rich country, um, your opportunities are almost boundless. Uh, whereas if you're born in a in a in a to a to a poor family or in a in a in a developing country, oftentimes your your potential your opportunities are so limited, and it's this lack of economic opportunity uh, that that is striking when you uh, have an opportunity to see uh, how people. Um, end up um, surviving um, in many places. So I'm going to move into um, sanitation, and um, and when we think about toilets or sanitation, you know today's gold standard is the um, is the uh, flush toilet um, connected to a wastewater treatment plant via sewers, uh, or what we'd like to call big pipe. And often at the end of that pipe, um, either there's a plant, a wastewater or sewage uh, treatment plant that is either not functional or maybe not even there, just dumps directly into the environment. And if you think about the, um, the uh, uh, flush toilet along with the sewer and then the, and then the treatment plant, uh, huge um, costs to build um, the initial non-recurring uh, capex, and then also high recurring costs to operate and maintain uh, the op opex for manpower, energy. Uh, think about all the water we use, uh, typically potable water, to flush a very small amount of uh, human fecal and um, urine. Um, and then the spares and the uh, upkeep of degrading infrastructure, uh, huge expenses. And oftentimes, um, development banks and, and NGOs and go other governmental aid will come in and build a wastewater treatment plant. And oftentimes, uh, within a few years, um, they're in disrepair. They're not fully functioning or oftentimes just shut down because of lack of this um, ability to keep them up. And then in, ru and then in rural and, and especially in informal settlements, uh, the norms are pit latrines or holding tanks. Um, they're, uh, having seen uh, quite a few of them, they are, they're very hard to use. 
they're dirty, smelly, uh, visually unappealing, and I'm saying that in a very nice way, uh, and often very hard to empty or oftentimes left to overflow into the environment. And then there's um, open defecation, uh, almost, a, almost the only choice for millions of people, uh, almost a billion actually. And, and oftentimes I think there, there's a judgment call about why do people open defecate. And the reality of it is that it's oftentimes the, the better, better choice when faced with uh, unsanitary conditions or pay toilets that you can't afford or potential for sexual violence uh, or a variety of other uh, rational reasons. And when we look at um, the current state of, of, um, of um, the way the, the fecal flows or what we call the uh, ship flow diagram, um, this is an example of uh, one city, uh, Dakar, Bangladesh. So on the face of it, it looks like um, they're doing really well. Um, if you look at the, uh, the amount of, uh, of uh, toilets that are uh, connected to sewer, 20%, 79% on-site facilities, pit latrines, uh, septic tanks, so forth, and just 1% open defecation, you'd think, wow, they're doing great. But in reality, if you look at um, the leakage in the pipes and the way that um, um, even the sewer, sewerage is not effectively treated, or the unsafely empty pit, pits or um, septic tanks, and in the end, um, in, in this particular city, 98% of the fecal waste is basically uh, going into the residential or uh, greater environment and so uh, if only 2% of the fecal sludge is being uh, properly disposed of or treated, um, we, we think of uh, poor fecal sludge management as akin to institutional open defecation. So today's sanitation crisis um, is effectively um, the, the joint monitoring program report uh, that just came out in July of, of this year um, from uh, the World Health Organization and UNICEF. It talks about 2.1 billion people uh, lacking access to safe, readily available water at home. D uh, more than double that amount lack safely managed sanitation. So the, the two are linked in that, um, in that uh, if you don't manage uh, sanitation properly, it also tends to uh, impact the, the groundwater and the surface waters that may be available for, uh, for use at homes. And then also, uh, as I previously mentioned, almost a billion people still defecate in the open. And diarrheal diseases kills over uh, 350,000 children at the age of five every year. And, and it, again, it impacts women and girls particularly. Um, and if one were to be able to resolve the sanitation crisis, um, it would actually uh, provide freedom for, for women and girls that are imprisoned by daylight in many cultures. The only time available for women um, uh, to go and defecate is after dark. So you basically end up not drinking, not eating, um, and holding, uh, which is very unhealthy un until its uh, privacy is afforded by light, uh, by darkness. Um, also impact of schools, uh, especially when uh, girls start to menstruate and the inability to take care of themselves properly when there's no facilities. Uh, the burden of, of caring for the sick uh, oftentimes falls on women and girls. And pregnant women are, are particularly uh, impacted by uh, diseases such as hookworm. And when we think about standards, um, you know, almost uh, 200 years ago, Sir Edwin Chadwick uh, was promoting plumbing regulations in England. Um, in London, they were um, uh, basically swimming um, in their own feces and, and diseases were pronounced. And this basically uh, unlocked the, the modern sewer technology. But even then, uh, the sewers were basically just uh, moving uh, the sewer downstream. And, um, and of course, subsequently, uh, treatment plants have come into, uh, into place. Um, and when we think about standards, uh, we approached it in a three-tiered manner. So the foundation worked directly with Tooth Sued um, and also started working with um, ANSI for, for ISO standard. But the initial work was to create um, a private 
standard for the uh, sustainable lawn sewer sanitation systems. And it defined the requirements from the perspective of uh, pathogens, environmental uh, requirements, as well as uh, aesthetics and smell and, and noise to make, make these uh, future systems um, appealing and aspirational. And the, uh, the private standard was then the basis for the uh, ISO International Workshop Agreement, IW24, which published um, uh, subsequent to the private standard. And it was the, um, it was the, led by American National Standards Institute, or ANSI, and it's an international consensus guideline document uh, via individual experts from all over the world. And uh, we had great participation in the writing of this, um, this document. And, um, and in fact, this particular document was used by the uh, CNTA, the China National Tourism Administration's um, request for proposal for more than 30,000 new toilets. I think there's a realization that when people go on, on a, uh, to a tourist site, uh, they expect some level of, um, of um, cleanliness and aspirational toilets. Then the IWA was used in turn for the development of the current ongoing ISO uh, 30500, <clears throat> excuse me, through Project Committee uh, 305. Uh, this is also led by American National Standards Institute with a twin secretariat in, from Senegal, the Association Senegalese de Normalization. Uh, it is their, uh, it is Senegal's equivalent to uh, US's ANSI. And this one, the, the, the ISO 30500 um, will be a, a standard for the non-sewer sanitation system. Um, and it is, uh, by process, a international consensus via participating nations, uh, not individuals, but it is through each individual nation's um, national standards bodies um, that this, is, this work is done. And it is a consensus document. And uh, what's really great is that there's a high level of participation of developing countries, and uh, that's based on the work of uh, the uh, American National Standards Institute, as well as uh, the Association of Senegal's Normalization to reach out to a number of um, sub-Saharan African nations and also um, great participation from Asian countries. Um, you can see that there's also great participation from uh, North America and Europe as well. Um, but we really did want to make sure that there were, uh, was great um, participation in developing countries. Uh, the ISO 30500 uh, is scheduled to publish end of 2018. Um, but of course, that depends on uh, how well the, uh, the, the, the subsequent meetings go. So when we think about the future toilets, um, we're, we're talking about non-sewer sanitation, um, where it is not um, uh, connected to any sewer or treatment plants at the end. Uh, it would all be accomplished, we call it the front end and the back end, and the actual um, elimination of pathogens, um, reduction in environmental um, uh, pollutants uh, operating off-grid, um, and also uh, having low-life uh, cycle costs, as well as uh, being being aspirational, being attractive, um, all of the processing would be done in situ. And our, our goal, our internal Gates Foundation goal, is is that once these fully scale up, that these would be affordable, even by um, the uh, the poor in developing countries. I mean, it, you'd be astounded um, that cell phones, uh, cell phone technologies that 20 years ago most of us in developed countries could not afford. Uh, are now readily available. And in these developing countries, um, I'm not aware that anyone is uh, waiting for the government or a company to or utility to string a wire so that they can talk to somebody either across town or um, around the world. It is cellular technology is, is a transformational technology. And we're looking to uh, these types of toilets, these aspirational toilets, to be similarly um, low in cost and also uh, effective.
Uh, Moira, I think, um, talked about uh, real quickly about sustainable development goals, um, and the United Nations uh, in 2015 established a series of them, and goal number six is to ensure availability and sustainability and sustainable management of water and sanitation for all. And this is different than the Millennium Development Goals that were um, put out at the beginning of this century relating to just being able to uh, have um, everyone have access to toilets, which was just capturing of the fecal waste. Um, this is about the whole value stream and, and how to make sure that uh, the impact is, is positive. And we firmly believe that, that in order for this to scale, uh, it has to, uh, the, the non-sewer sanitation has to be a viable business. Um, it has to be business opportunities for small and medium enterprises, it, and it has to scale. Uh, the only way um, um, uh, millions of these toilets <clears throat> in the future uh, will be used and will be um, uh, helping communities is if, um, if there's a business available. And, and key parts of that are enable environments, enabling environments as well as uh, marketplace readiness. And uh, some of the elements for enabling environment uh, are collaboration with local governments um, and through regulations and through policies, they can actually enhance demand for sanitation. And the topic of our conversation today, uh, supporting um, implementation of quality standards uh, Moira mentioned the the benefits of standards um, to the consumer, to the to the um, to the uh, uh, manufacturer, to to the entire market stream, and then as well as the marketplace readiness, uh, fostering, uh, like I mentioned, regulatory supportive regulatory environment, as well as uh, leveraging our work with development banks and and uh, aid organizations. These are just some examples of um, reinvented toilets um, that that uh, universities and other organizations have been working on. Uh, from the upper left-hand corner, Research Triangle Institute's uh, gasifier system, uh, University of uh, or Cranfield University's nanomembrane toilet systems in the upper middle. On the upper right, uh, that's uh, Caltech's uh, system, which is an electrochemical uh, system. And then uh, the one below that. Uh, is a Kohler. Uh, Kohler is known for whiteware and, and genset develop, uh, gensets, and they built a unit using the Ca California Institute of Technologies uh, technology um, and attached it to an apart to some apartment buildings in India as test. Uh, to the left of that is the University of Toronto's uh, smoldering toilet, and then the, the what we call the the water wall water world. Water wall, sorry about that, um, uh, from uh, EOVAG. And then lastly, um, Loughborough University's uh, hydrothermal carbonization toilet. And these are all in different stages of prototyping and uh, commercial, um, commercial development. And in the end, um, you know, the reason we're, we're working uh, on this and many, many other um, areas is uh, we envision a world where every person has the opportunity to live a healthy and productive life. So with that, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sun. Uh, this was a very rich and uh, close to home hitting presentation. And as a graduate of University of Toronto myself, I'm actually pretty excited to see that U of T is in the running with one of these uh, new prototypes. So with that, um, we are arriving at the Q&A portion of, of the webinar. Um, I encourage everybody to enter their questions into the Q&A window so we can go ahead and address them with our speakers. Um, just to get the ball rolling, uh, I wanted to find out from both of you if you could speak to, um, obviously the nature of the standards development process is quite lengthy, and uh, I wanted to hear from you, are there alternatives to standards for ensuring quality? What are some examples that you can share? And this could be either Moira or, or Sun. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hi, this is Moira. I'm happy to, um, uh, you know, try to address that uh, 
and then Sun, of course, can add to that from his perspective. Um, but yeah, I think it depends on on the the need that you have uh, and and the scope of the the challenge as well. Um, you know, sometimes when you need global interoperability or, or global solutions, um, you may have a different approach than if it's a more localized challenge. Uh, but there certainly are other areas such as more um, lightweight, I know some people call them guidelines or specifications or, or pre-standards, um, so that you can um, address issues. I highlighted a few pre-standards activities that IEEE does where we enable people to come together and, you know, maybe develop white papers to address challenges or, or come up with solutions in that way. Uh, you don't have that same process with uh, you know, that same um, guarantee of how it was developed, but it can certainly help you come up with good solutions. And then just one comment on, on standards being lengthy, uh, I think that is often also related to uh, the degree of consensus that you have when you start the work. Sometimes mm -hmm. stakeholders and in industry have already converged on a direction before they start the standards process, and when there is such high-level consensus, it can actually be a faster process, maybe completing in a year to two years versus longer timeframes that we sometimes hear about. Thank you for that context. And um, just uh, out of curiosity, and in terms of the participants in the standards process, is uh, there a preferred ratio or a mixture of representatives from, let's say, various sectors such as industry or academia mm -hmm. or standards development? Yeah, so uh, one of the things that I highlighted, a key principle is balance of types of stakeholders. Mm -hmm. And that means that you can't have more than a third coming from one group. Now, the groups are different in each project because you know, it, it depends on the question you're trying to address. Sometimes you're looking mm -hmm. at having manufacturers, users, general interests. Sometimes you have researchers, academics. So who they are is different, but you do need a balance uh, and no more than a third from the same type of group. Awesome. Yeah. Um, well, go ahead, please, son. Yeah, and if I could just jump in on, on the the question about, you know, other other ways of uh, standardization or, or uh, motivating the market. Uh, from our perspective, um, you know, we, we looked at a lot of different options and you'll notice that we kind of went in stages. And I think there are places for all, all sorts of different kinds of standards, whether they're industry standards, um, uh, private standards, industry standards, mm -hmm. uh, national standards, regional standards, international standards. Right. And from our perspective, you know, the work we're doing, uh, we felt that this was the best way to have, well, we did not want to have a tier system where developed countries get great toilets and developing countries get, you know, uh, crappy toilets. And right. so so we, we wanted to set one bar and we've been working uh, extensively at mm -hmm. PC305 to try not to tier these into different levels, but to just really come up with one standard. I mean, to me, it's kind of, um, I, I know standards do this, but it's weird for me to have, to see standards that have different levels of standards or different levels. So, mm -hmm. so to us, an international standard in this particular um, situation was appropriate, uh, but we could see um, other other opportunities for guidelines, as Moira mentioned, uh, in mm -hmm. different applications. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, a question that actually come in on our website ahead of the presentation and I, I found uh, interesting and uh, could be controversial uh, was asked regarding access to standards themselves. Often standards uh, are uh, to use them to access the information you have to pay. In terms of standards that are addressing uh, these essential needs, uh, is there a construct uh, relative to payment? Is there anything that you could share and, and help to enlighten us on that? Yeah, if, if I'd jump in there, because um, we we at the Gates Foundation, um, typically uh, anything that's done at re uh, by research universities or, or even companies, um, we ask um, uh, that research uh, be published in peer-reviewed journals and be open access. 
So that's a fundamental mm-hmm. belief that we have that, you know, for global good, we, we want the information to be shared. Uh, but we also recognize that, that these standards are, are created um, by a consortium of individuals who are volunteering their time and that, that uh, whoever owns the standard has the, the, the copyright. Um, mm-hmm. we, are, we are very interested in, in having wide dissemination, so we have been working with, um, with our partners to figure out ways of either pre-purchasing blocks of standards uh, but but it's a it's a great question. Um, we we agree with it with with the premise of that question, uh, and we're working towards um, you know it, it will not be the majority of standards, uh, but um, but we think there are some opportunities. So we are working on that. Thank you, Mara. Yeah. Is anything you want to add? Mm-hmm. Yeah, sure. And I, I think uh, similar to what Sun said, I think, and I appreciate that Sun. Uh, also acknowledged the challenges of um, we have to fund the the development in a manner it, somehow, right? And uh, the sale yeah. of standards is part of that. But we do also see um, that it is important to make standards as widely available as possible. And we are looking at different options. IEEE more broadly has open access uh, type um, activities and open source activities as well. One program that we have is called the GET program, and we try to encourage stakeholders or potentially funding agencies to uh, offset the cost and to make standards available. Um, For example, the 802 standards, which include Wi-Fi and Ethernet, um, mm-hmm. You know, they have decided to, to, to do that funding so that their standards become available for free six months after publication. And other groups of standards, this happens as well, and we could envision that, you know, we can work with uh, stakeholders to try to come to an arrangement and, and make that happen. Thank you. That That's very interesting, and it's great to see that there are already pathways for ensuring accessibility to these essential standards. Uh, with that, we have approached time. We do apologize for actually uh, the extra two minutes over, but appreciate uh, all of the attendees who have joined us today. And thank you so much to our fantastic presenters for giving us a kind of a behind-the-scenes look into the, this critical work that you are doing. Thank you all. Uh, You can find the recording will be available on our professional development page. For those of you seeking professional development hours, please use the code uh, listed on this slide. If we didn't address your questions and you would like uh, us to do so, email us at webinars at engineeringforchange.org. With that, I will wish you all a good morning, good evening, or good afternoon, depending where you are, and encourage you all to join us as EFMC members to get information on our upcoming webinars. Thank you all. Thank you to our presenters, and goodbye.